the most important thing. Wait on the Holy Spirit. This book, the book of Acts, all about the early church, it is a book of action. It's not passive. It encourages and challenges us to take our faith to the next level. He should be the first space that we look for for healing and restoration. He should be the first phone number we call. We have been called to bring shalom to this earth as Jesus Jesus. did. y'all. Good morning. If we haven't met yet, my name is Emmanuel Escobar. I'm the discipleship pastor at Beat Church. And if we have met yet and you're like, where has he been for the last three months? I didn't die. I'm fine. (laughs) I'm okay. Uh, I had, for those that you didn't know, I'm recovering from surgery. I'm almost done, thankfully. It's all well. And then also I was in Uganda, and I feel like there was a thousand other things going on, I don't know, that had kept me from being up here on stage sharing with you guys, but I'm back, and I'm glad to be here. I missed y'all. I missed y'all. I will say this, this is a very small part of the job. This is like the tip of the iceberg that it comes to, when it comes to shepherding people. And uh, you guys are such a fun group of people to shepherd. You're fun, you're open, there's always something going in y'all's lives. Thank you for keeping us on our toes. Uh, We just want to tell you that we really enjoy uh, being entrusted with leading you guys into the word of God. Which is exactly what we're going to talk about today. Pastor Jerry did an excellent job last Sunday sharing with us out of the book of Acts the ultimate understanding of Christ's lordship and how that can be really difficult to accept in our lives because the last thing we want to do is give up control. Because unfortunately, we have seen many horrible examples of people taking control and ruining other people's lives. And yet Pastor Jerry shared with us that God... Christ is a God that you can trust with control. And it's a God that if you really want to know, if you really want to benefit from an interaction with him, you must give him lordship. And today, we're going to continue in the book of Acts as before. Um, And in a similar vein to speaking about God's lordship. Because today, I'm going to teach you guys how to wrestle with God's word. That might sound like a weird thing for you, wrestling with God's word. But I want you to know that in the book of Genesis, there's a very interesting story about a young man named Jacob. A young man named Jacob that decides to get into a wrestling match with what scripture describes as an angel of God. As this man was wrestling both literally physically with this angel and internally with his own problems in his life. And he's feeling God call him to go and do. Yet at the same time, he longs for the safety and comfort of his home. And while he's wrestling with should I, should I not, should I yield to God and give him lordship or should I stay in my comfort zone as he's wrestling, this angel sets a nasty heel hook and Pops his socket. Any UFC guys in the crowd? Any fans? Yeah, we got one. Thanks, bro. Me and you, bro. Next weekend, okay? Uh, (laughs) Heel hooks are not allowed for a reason now in lower belts. But anyhow. uh, Yeah, pops his socket. And this man now forever walks with a limp. Forever changed. That man was then renamed Israel, and he was the father of our faith. 
He was the father of the Israelite people that grew into a kingdom that still lasts to this day. And it is those Jewish roots that gave us the Messiah, Jesus Christ, that redeemed us of our, sin, of our sins. All of this, a beautiful plan for God to show us that not only does he want to have union with us, he wishes to co-labor with us. That plan came from a man named Jacob. Jacob means he who wrestles with God. Isn't it insane that the Lord of the universe is willing to get into a wrestling match with you? Isn't it insane that the one that has absolute authority, the one that has the right to demand absolute obedience right here, right now, is willing to step into the ring with you? is willing for you to experience what you need to experience, for you to push back on him and for you to grab him and say, no, I don't want to. He's willing to roll in the dirt with you so that you may know him, so that a nation may be birthed out of you. This is the God that we serve, a God that wrestles. A God that has every right to sit on a throne with absolute command, yet is willing to lock in with you and process with you and still prevail. This is what we're going to learn today. How to wrestle with scriptures. How to wrestle with the King of Kings and why it is so important to do that. So let's pray today, guys. Let's pray that the Lord moves in our hearts. That if so far, if this has just been another regular Sunday for you, that today we're taking the moment to be intentional and say, you know what, Lord? Let me hear from you. Mm. Holy Spirit, we love you. Thank you for wrestling with us. Holy Spirit, we invite you today into this room. We invite you today online, wherever people are watching, that you may have your way, Lord. Holy Spirit, I've said this to you already this morning. Don't let me waste your people's time. May your kingdom come. May your will be done, Lord. May what people hear be exactly what you desire for them to connect with. And may you be the one that brings transformation to their lives. May my name be forgotten. May people move on. Yet your kingdom may remain. In the name of Jesus, have your way in our lives, holy king. Thank you for your patience and for your kindness. For those that are still suspicious of who you are. That you are in no hurry. And that you're here for them. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. It matters that we get this. It matters that we understand that God is a God that wrestles. Because far too many Christians out there are living a, lay, a life and a faith based out of emotions. Far too many Christians out there are living a faith built on nothing else but what feels right. Far too many Christians out there are seeing their faith through the lens of what fits for them and what doesn't. And as a result, far too many unbelievers out there look at our faith as a disjointed thing that stands for nothing. Far too many unbelievers look at our faith and they see this oddly cobbled rules of morality that apply sometimes to everyone else except to us. It matters that we understand the foundation of God's word and us be willing to wrestle with it because far too many people allow emotions to hold a 
authority in their lives over the word of God. Far too many people put way more value to how they feel about God's word rather than what it actually says. Now, I am not going to be as bold as perhaps other people that would say that your emotions are irrelevant. To say that how you feel about God's word doesn't matter. To me, that's just a horrible misunderstanding of human psyche. (laughs) Of course your emotions matter. Of course they do. You need them to process. So to say that your emotions about God's word, how you feel about God's word is irrelevant, it's just a horrible misunderstanding of how people function. If you wish for God to transform your heart, your emotions, your feelings must be involved. You must get to a word in his Bible where you go, whoa, I don't like that. Whoa, whoa, what you mean? The earth opened up and swallowed them? What? Killed the women and the children? What? Slaves, be thankful to your owners? What? We must have very real reactions when we get to pieces of scripture that make us go, oh, that doesn't seem like the God that I've been called to serve. That doesn't seem like the heart of compassion and love and mercy that called me and drew me to him, which is biblical. It's important that we understand that your emotions, by all means, how you feel about God's word is very much relevant. But they're not definitive. Your emotions are very much relevant, but they're not definitive. How you feel about God's word, how you feel about the one passage that popped into your head is very much relevant, but it is not definitive. One of the things that Pastor Jerry shares all the time that I really enjoy, and I've shared it with my son, is, listen, man, your emotions are great indicators, but they're horrible leaders. Your emotions are such good indicators. Let's you know, oh, I don't like that. Or, I like that too much. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Your emotions are great indicators. They're horrible leaders. Your emotions are deeply relevant to the word of God. But they're not definitive. If there is something that you're willing to change, submit, make humble to God, it should be your emotions. It should be your emotions. It should be the first thing that you're willing to put in the line is your quote-unquote feelings about God. I need you to understand that wrestling with God and submitting your emotions to the word of God will only deepen your faith with him. Listen to me. There is a train of thought in Christianity in which this book is so holy that don't you dare ask a question about it. That don't you dare say, I don't know that I agree with that. That don't you dare say, I'm not sure how I feel about that. That's avoiding the fight. That's avoiding the fight. That's not being transformed by God. That's not wrestling with the one that will change you at the end of that match. Listen to me. I believe in this book not because I was told to. I believe in this book not because I'm afraid of hell. I've seen hell. I've had the blessings now of being able to preach the gospel in five different nations around the world. I've seen babies root through trash to find something to eat. I've seen girls be traded for groceries. I've seen hell. It's here. It's now. I'm not scared about hell in the future. I'm very much concerned about the hell that we're experiencing right now. 
I don't believe this book because I'm afraid of burning in fire and brimstone. I believe this book because this has given me the power to overcome hell on earth. I believe in this book because this has given me the ability to overcome the anxiety that overwhelmed me, the depression that crushed my soul, because this has given me the power to be the man that can lead my family and care for my community. This book is the answer to whatever hell you're experiencing right now. That's why I believe in the scripture. Not because I don't question it, not because I'm afraid to push against it, but because I have locked myself in a room with it. I've showed my arms under its pit and pinned it to the ground, and we have rolled and rolled and rolled and rolled, and the only one left standing was Jesus. This book, this faith desires for you to shove back desires for you to question and say, I don't understand. I don't agree with that. I don't feel that that is right. Shove back. The king of kings will prevail. He will prevail. There is countless stories of agnostic historians getting into this book to try to disprove him only to fall in love with him the king of kings will prevail because that's the thing guys i'm talking about a wrestling match but don't get it twisted you have no chance of winning <laughs> remember that guy was walking like this forever now you know you will be changed by it you will be transformed by it. I want you to understand that the hope you seek is found in the ring with God's word. Whatever it is, anxiety you've been feeling, depression you've been experiencing, insecurities you've been battling for years, your loss of temper, your lack of patience, your lack of self-control. You keep falling for the same thing over and over again. Whatever hope you seek is found in the ring with God's word. It's not about a philosophy. It's not about rules that are right and wrong. It is not about national uh, Christi Christianity or Christian nationalism. And it's not about postmodern philosophy. Neither of one of those things can satisfy. You can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with those and beat them easy. Believe me, I have. Once you start poking, things crumble really easily. <laughs> it's not about that. It's about a faith that stands. We must learn to wrestle with the word of God. Because on the other side of it, there is transformation and healing for our lives. Do you want that? Do you want that? Do you desire that for your life? Then step into the ring. I get it. I'm the little bit more aggressive one. But I am telling you, step into the ring. Step into the ring. He's welcoming that. He's welcoming that. Don't let doubts be what keeps you from knowing him. Bring it to him. Bring it to him. Lock in with him. Ding, ding, ding. Two-minute rounds. We'll make it easy and short. <laughs> if you never wrestle, believe me, two minutes is long enough. <laughs> Let's see a perfect example of that in Scripture. Let's jump back into the book of Acts, exactly where Pastor Jerry left us off. Acts chapter 17, verse 10. We're going to be going through verse 15. Can I find Acts in this book? I say that, you, you laugh, but uh, this is the book of John is over here. So... 
I sometimes have to check. When books, when books end very abruptly, I'm like, oh, well, right, that's in Genesis now. <laughs> I tucked it in back there. <laughs> Acts 17, 17, 17, 17, chapter 10, verse 15. That very night, believers sent Paul to si- and Silas to Berea. When they arrived there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Stop right there. Why so early? This is why. I'm going to show you guys three questions that I teach my son to ask every time he approaches Scripture. Because if you're going to get in the ring with the Word of God, I want to give you the tools. I want to give you a few basic moves that you will need to have in order to go through this match and come out transformed. The first one is that context is deeply important. Whatever you're reading, the context around it is deeply important. And so I taught my son three questions for him to ask every time he goes into a piece of scripture because it's important to have context around the scripture that you're reading. That's the difference between uh, our sisters being able to fully live out into their purpose and empowerment by the Lord Jesus and our sisters not being allowed to wear pants. Right? And being told that they have to stay in a certain place. Right? Like, context is massively important. (laughs) Two overwhelming leaders are like, thank you. (laughs) Really, context is massively important. Because without context, without context, you could be finding yourself rooting for the oppression of others and thinking the Lord is on your side. Or, without context, you could find yourself going, there's no rules, because God loves everything. And while emboldened by your bravery, supposedly, you're going down a path of sin and destruction. Context is incredibly important. And by no means, let me say this, I am a pastor, I am in his word, I study it, I read often, but... You know, this guy's talking about wrestling up here. A scholar, he is not, you know. Uh, <laughs> so these, everything I teach, I try, you know, I love the scholars in my life. They're the ones I go to with questions. I'm like, hey, man, can you help me understand this? You know what I mean? Um, but these are the simple things that I, u- I teach my son this. We used to have this habit of I would teach him uh, theology every Friday morning, um, we, there a lot has been brought up into our lives that has shifted our schedules. We're trying to find a time to pick that up again. But I taught him these are the three questions that I want you to ask every time that you're about to tackle a scripture, every time that you're about to wrestle with a scripture. The very first one that you need to know is who wrote it? Who wrote it? Who wrote the book that you're about to read? If you're not familiar with it, it's okay if your answer right now is Jesus. Uh, But no. (laughs) No. Good guess. Solid guess. But no. (laughs) This book is a combination of poetry and letters and uh, historical sagas. I mean, this book is a collection of many other books. And many of those books have different authors. You need to understand who is the author. Who wrote it? Because they will tell you a lot about the book that you're reading. So I'm going to give you a simple answer for the book of Acts. We believe that the book of Acts was written by Luke. He was a physician, and he was a big fan of being as accurate to historical accounts as possible. So when you read something in the book of Acts, to simply say, oh, he was just probably being poetic. No, no, probably not. Because, again, this guy was big on accuracy. So if he wrote something, you can best believe it happened. So it's important to know who wrote it. The second question, who were they speaking to? Who was being addressed? Who was receiving the information that was being preached? You need to know that. 
If it's a young man trying to learn how to pastor and shepherd, a.k.a. Timothy, there is going to be very direct instructions of like, brother, here's how you can keep the peace in your church. I know you're young. I know you have no idea what you're doing. Here's some advice from me. Is it just the people of Israel in a book of poetry wanting to capture their stories and their culture? Well, that's going to change the way you read that book. It's important that you ask yourself, who wrote it, who are they speaking to, and lastly, what was the motivation? What was the motivation? Again, was it just to take a historical account of what happened? Was it to write a beautiful poem by the Jewish tradition about a woman with a neck like a tower? What was the purpose? Was it to write a letter to encourage people? What was the purpose of what you're reading? Answering these three questions can be very easily. There is a website. You might not be familiar with it. It's called, it starts with a G, uh, google.com, G-O-O-G-L-E dot C-O-M dot com. You can put queries in there, and it will give you answers. Now, I don't think I need to tell you that just because in the internet, it's in the internet doesn't mean it's true. Maybe I do. By the way, just because it's the internet, it's not true. It doesn't mean that it's true. So use common sense as you're reading through things, as you're investigating, as you're getting these answers. If, <laughs> if, you're, if your information is coming from a sketchy website, check with a friend. Hey, I'm a pastor. Send me an email. Hey, pastor, I found this. Is this accurate? Like, that's what we're here to do. Your life group leaders, that's why it's so important for you to be in community. Your life group leaders, hey, I have a question about this. Your life group coach, hey, I have a question about this. If you haven't, take our New Testament Bible track. I'm very excited. We're going to be having an Old Testament Bible track launching in the spring. Like, Take those. Yeah, it's going to be great. Take advantage of these resources so you can have the important context that you need. All right, so let's go back into the verse. That very night, the believers sent Paul and Silas. So now we know what this story is about. The context is about Paul and Silas. And when they arrived there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. So we know who's being addressed. People in a Jewish synagogue the majority of them people of the Jewish culture. So we know, we now are understanding context that more than likely these people are not completely foreign to the concept of God. They actually have a pretty deep understanding of who God is. Let's go to verse 11. And the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. The people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. This is very important. In order to properly wrestle with God, you have to be open to having your mind and your heart changed. You have to be open to have your mind and your heart changed. If you're reading it and you're refusing to let go of your position, you're not in a wrestling match. You're just shouting at somebody. If you're getting in the ring with God, that means that you're going to wrestle. That means that your initial position is going to change. You have to be willing. You have to have at least an open heart and mind to let God change you. One of my favorite poets, his name is Marisiahu, a Jewish man out of uh, Wash Heights, New York. He wrote, you want God, but you can't deflate your ego. If you're already there, then there's nowhere to go. If your cup's already full, then it's bound to overflow. You can't possibly have God if your ego is full. You can't possibly be transformed by him if you don't think you need to be. If you want to wrestle with God, an open mind and heart are incredibly important. If you want to wrestle with God... An open mind and heart are important. The scriptures continue. And they listened eagerly to Paul's message. I love that. Eagerly. They were eager. But that does not mean that they agreed. There's a big difference between I want to hear what you have to say and I completely agree with what you have to say. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? 
Do you guys see that that's what's broken in our society? That if we don't agree, then I don't want to hear what you have to say. That is so broken. That if we don't agree, then I'm not eager to hear what you have to say. This isn't saying that the people in Berea were already aligned with Paul. They were say, it's saying that they were eager. They were expectant to hear what they had to say. When you're wrestling with the word of God, expectation is important. When you're wrestling with the word of the living God, expectation is incredibly important. Not only do you have to be willing to be changed, but you need to be expectant that God is going to do something for you. That God is going to show you a move you've never seen before. That you might think you have them, but psych. (laughs) I'll show you guys the story real quick. So my my family does jujitsu. Don't be impressed by me. I barely have one strike. Uh, be impressed by my wife. My wife's a killer. But anyhow, um, I'm wrestling, and there's a guy in our gym. Uh, we call him um, uh, Rolo. If you guys watch the Viking series on, on History Channel, anybody? Rolo is this just bear of a man, and this dude looks exactly like him. So we call him Rolo. He had long hair and everything. And our professor's like, all right, man, you and Rolo, go at it. I'm like, are you kidding me, dude? This guy's like six-something, just muscle. I'm like, crap, you know? So here I am. I have a move. I am really good at arm bars. So I'm like, I'm going to get this dude right off the bat, right? I waste no time. I go in. Phew, I go to set the arm bar. This dude is so big. He literally goes like, picks me up over himself. And I just go, Yeah! <laughs> And brings me crashing down. And the match ended. As I said, don't be impressed by me. (laughs) I just needed to tell you that. Be expectant that God is going to do something that might blow your mind. Be expectant that God might pull a move that you go, I've never seen that before. Expectation is incredibly important. The scripture goes on. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. Did you guys get that? They searched the scriptures day after day to see, to confirm, to make sure that Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. They didn't just go, okay. Which is a perception that many people have about our faith. That the only reason you believe it is because your mommy and your daddy taught you to believe it. They don't understand those that wrestle. They don't understand those that go, no, dude, I've poked at it plenty, trust me. And it still stands. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. When it comes comes to wrestling with the word of God, curiosity is incredibly important. Incredibly important. There has to be something in you that goes, I don't understand this. Uh, Let me look this up. I don't get it. Uh, Let me text Sarah real quick. I'm not really sure what this means. Let me reach out to my life group leader and ask. There has to be curiosity in you. What does God really mean by this? And when you put all of those things together, when you put your curiosity, your expectation, your willingness to be changed, when you put all of those things together, there's something very powerful that happens in that ring. And that thing is transformation. We exist to reach, raise up, and release followers of Jesus who change the world. That's not just this church's mandate. That's yours. There are people in your life that I will never be able to preach to. There are people in your community that Pastor Jerry will never be able to counsel and pray for. You are the pastors of your community. You are the representatives of Christ in your family. You are the representatives of the Lord Jesus everywhere you go. You must be transformed. 
You can't possibly disciple somebody if you yourself have not been discipled. If you yourself have not been changed by wrestling with Jesus. If you yourself don't walk with a limp. You have to be different. You have to look, sound, and act different. You have to be transformed by the King of Kings if we ever have hope of changing the world. If we ever have hope of seeing families reunited, of seeing sex trafficking stopped, of seeing addictions broken, if we ever have hope of that happening, we must step into the ring with the Lord and we must be transformed by his spirit and by his holy word. Chapter 12 continues. As a result, many Jews believed, as did many prominent Greek women and men. The only proper response to his word is humility and repentance. That's the only proper response. That's how you know you've been transformed. When at the end, you read it, and you go... Dude, I screwed up. I shouldn't have talked to her that way. I was not patient. You read it and you go, it has been about me this whole time. Humility and repentance is the only proper response to the word of the Lord. Where there is humility and awe and worship in who he is. Or where there's humility at recognizing what a wreck you are. (laughs) Humility and repentance, it's how you're transformed. Listen to me, seasoned believers. If you haven't experienced humility and repentance since you've been in the church of God, I'm going to invite you to check your hearts. If humility and repentance is not something that you're familiar with and yet you've been in church for the last 20, 10, 15, 30, 50 years, if humility and repentance is not a common thing in your heart, I really want to encourage you to check your heart and your relationship with your God. Because I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to be shepherding you all along with this amazing team of other pastors. And let me tell you that my most common reaction to his word is not, nailed it. (laughs) Yeah, Dito, Lord, that's true. That's true. No. My most common interaction with his word is, Lord, change me. Change me. We must learn to wrestle with God's word. It is the only way we will be transformed. We must learn to wrestle with his word. It is the only way we will be transformed by it. This is my Bible. I got saved in 2008. And I had a very emotional interaction with God. And I was like, let's do this. It must be for real. And I was scared the whole time that at any minute, all that emotion and fervor and excitement was just going to fade away. And I was going to go right back to my life. And I remember telling God, it can't be the same. And I shared this story with some of you guys already where I'm like, it can't be the same. And just as it happens, a mentor of mine, Miss Loria Smith, warrior for the Lord, goes, The Lord wanted me to give you this. And she gives me a Bible in the New Living Translation. And I look at it and I go, oh, I've done this before. It does not work well. Me not speaking English very good. (laughs) And then I open it and I'm like, Jesus speaks English. That's crazy. I can understand it. The New Living Translation It's a beautiful translation that is accurate and easy to comprehend, great for me. By no means am I telling you it's great for you. 
I'm simply telling you I found something that I could understand. That Bible is long gone by now. I have no idea where it is. I gifted it to a friend um, while we were preaching in the streets in Baton Rouge. Uh, I knew I wasn't going to see this man again. He was kind of like a transient man, and he was kind of going through town, going on to Mississippi, I think. So I was like, here, bro, you don't have a Bible. Have my Bible. I then immediately went and bought another Bible, NLT, and that's this one. This one has been with me since 2009. I have bled on this Bible, literally, I cut myself. (laughs) There is tears on this Bible. I'm telling you, the book of John is out here loosely. It is falling, it is literally held together by stickers that every time a new crack shows up, I put a new one on. This thing has been in my backpack across five different nations. This has tumbled from rocks. This has fallen into creeks and I've just kind of shook it a little bit. This, this Bible has been with me, and this Bible is what kept me change. This Bible was the difference between an emotional response of, yes, Jesus, have it all, and a steady walk day after day being transformed by the Holy Spirit. This Bible made that difference for me. I would love for yours to eventually do the same. Listen, I'm a preacher. I get it. We live for the emotional responses. I don't want an emotional response from you. Your emotions are relevant, but they're not definitive. What I want to see is fruit. What I want to see is Beach Church to become a place that is so comfortable wrestling with the Lord that we're transformed by Him. I want to see Beach Church to be a place where not necessarily people run to the altar, although you're more than welcome to. Please do so. Please take advantage of of this space and prayer. But afterwards, I pray that you walk away with a limp that you walk away transformed by his power. Because true freedom is only found through transformation with him. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we love you and we submit ourselves to you. Jesus, I pray that your word encompasses everything and everyone that was here, Lord. Lord, that you anoint us in your spirit, that you anoint us in your power, Lord. And that people respond however you feel led them to. If they want to come to the altar and get prayer, Lord. If they want to sit in their their seat, Lord. If they want to raise their hand, however you feel led them to respond. I pray that it goes beyond just that and into deep transformation with you. In the name of Jesus, may you have your way at Beach Church. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.